Welcome back to Why the Managerial Estate Will Fail. This is the second part to this multi-part series on why managerialism will fail, or technocracy. We could use that term to describe this too. Another term is techno-feudalism. And where we left off, we were just beginning to delve into how surrealism, the surrealist art movement of the 20th century, and how that relates to managerialism and this idea, this sort of grand utopian idea which finds its origin points in ancient mystery religions who have continued all the way up to the present, be it in a sort of intellectual or ideological fashion and perhaps even, you know, through bloodlines as well, through the, the inheritance of this ethical will to bring about, to fulfil a utopian, ancient utopian vision. Therefore, to continue our notes, by this one may conclude that we dwell within a surreality of society, where the managerialists act like surrealist artists, attempting to paint a utopia by way of intentional, intense and decidedly irrational juxtaposition of a plurality of forms and cultures, right? By this, we see within surrealist art pieces. Uh, for example, one of the famous ones is The Persistence of Memory by Salvador Dali, where we see this rather minimalist, bland, almost barren wasteland that acts as the backdrop to these typically rigid, analog uh, timepieces. But they are bending, they are, they have a, a sort of fluid form. They bend around and contort around various objects within the scene. And it creates a, an almost a dreamlike quality to the piece. And the juxtaposition, the, the contrast between all of these you know, seeming incongruencies so, for example, the usually rigid timepiece is now fluid in form. It, it sort of um, it troubles the viewer. It intrigues them as well. There's a sort of morbid curiosity behind all of surrealist art in this, in this respect. Digressing. What is produced is an amorphous concentration of power, lacking culture, but at the same time being imbued by all cultures, lacking a concrete and unifying ideology, but championing all ideologies, at least superficially, and being without a discernible direction or course, but seemingly taking all courses and traversing all directions at once. This also is a strategy in which power obfuscates itself. It escapes the prying eyes, the suspicious glare of the populace. So, by keeping the populace guessing, by keeping them chasing their tails or, you know, going down endless rabbit holes trying to find the, the concentrated centre of power, of, of course they never will find that. It, the form is amorphous, right? They mitigate any resistance, any physical resistance to them, because if the populace have no symbol of power in which they can, you know, no concentrated symbol of power in which they can tear down, then they will put all of their dissident energy, all of their resistance, all of that pent up anger and angst, they will um, transfer that, um, funnel it, focus it into trying to find the concentration of power, which they never will, right? It's a way to sort of disrupt dissi uh, dissident uprisings and to dispel of any unwanted anti-establishmentarian sentiments within society, to dissipate the energy that, that could take down the power structure. 
The managerialist, surrealist regime is one that conceals itself within the clutter of plurality and seemingly indecisive identity. Yet, this poses the issue of becoming meaningless to the outward subjects that are under the cosh of this multi-headed behemoth. Surrealism is defined in these terms by the movements, and just before we get into that, that's in, in many ways the double-edged sword of that strategy of appearing to be amorphous, appearing to have no ideology, right? By appearing to have no ideology, you have nothing that in the long term binds the subjects to to that concentration of power, to supporting, to legitimizing that concentration of power. So therefore, what you end up getting is a sort of meaningless culture, an inauthenticity surrounding everything, which is, of course, what we see. Look, look at any of the progressive speakers, any of the progressive ideologies and ideological branches. Even the culture, prime example of that recently is Disney's uh, new Star Wars series called Acolyte. It is absolutely abysmal. It seems like it's an exercise in money laundering, really, uh, given the, the amount of money they're spending on it. I think it's $750,000 per minute, but it's totally vapid. It's meaningless. And it and that vapidness is tangible. I mean, it, it jumps out at the, uh, of the screen at you as a viewer. I mean, you can feel it, the inauthenticity around it. Surrealism is defined in these terms by the movement's spokesperson, Andre Breton, who wrote the art movement's first manifesto in the 1920s. He stated of surrealism that, quote, the mind of the man who dreams is fully satisfied by what happens to him. The agonising question of possibility is no longer pertinent. Kill, fly faster, love to your heart's content. And if you should die, are you not certain of reawakening among the dead? Let yourself be carried along. Events will not tolerate your interference. You are nameless. The ease of everything is priceless. I believe in the future resolution of these two states. Again, this is the coincidentia appositorum, this is totally part of the occult, this is the, this ultimately informs the, the occult, the esoteric agenda, the overarching agenda. So the future resolution of these two states, dream and reality, which are seemingly so contradictory, into a kind of absolute reality, a surreality, if one may so speak, this idea of dream and reality could be defined as consciousness and unconsciousness in a very mystical and even antiquated sense. This is the difference between, um, in the Gnostic tradition, Yaldabaoth, the demiurge, the craftsman of the material world, the nous, the mind, the, again, consciousness, the, that which uh, creates and perceives conscious reality and the one or the pleroma the fullness what one would call God right the unconscious the primordial sea of the unconscious when you go to sleep when you dream that is what you're tapping into that point of inception where you have no you just are you have no real awareness of both time and space, therefore you're uh, beyond dimensionality, you're not tethered to any axial system, you're beyond the temporal and the spatial dimension, right, and in many ways. So this is what this is speaking to, and of course even in biblical parameters, you have, for example, Deuteronomy 32 verses 8 to 9, read the Orthodox Hebrew uh, Bible and the translation of that, and you will find that there is a distinction made between the Lord and God. And of course, even the idea that the Lord is, is jealous, right? He's a, he's a, he is a jealous God. That the Lord is, 
is a jealous creature or force. That itself speaks to this notion that he does not have full sovereignty over not this creation, but over a reality itself, right? That, again, one is jealous, for example, over a spouse because they feel like they lack value in the eyes of that spouse, that there is a problem of security there, right? And again, that comes from their deep, their deep-seated sense of their own, uh, of their own image, of of their self-image, based around their their views of their own value. What this is sort of implying, in a very, you know, theological or metaphysical sense, is that the Lord is not, you know, the prime of being. He's not the prime, um, the prime creator of creation, if that makes sense. He may have created creation, but there was something that created him. That's what that implies. And you see this throughout the Old Testament, actually. You you see it dotted everywhere. Those are the two most pertinent examples of that. But that speaks to what we're stating here, and of course, what the mystery schools have stated since, well, since as far back as I can see, uh, Sumeria, Babylon, uh, all of these, you know, various ancient civilizations and their various theologies, mythologies, and the the consequent mystery schools that branched forth from them. Continuing on, akin to the postmodern concept of legitimation by paralogy, the prime work of Jean-Francois Lyotard where the deconstructionist or regression-drunk sophisticate desires a turn towards thinking that is beyond reason, beyond structure, beyond God itself. In the case of the legitimation by paralogy, it opts to manufacture truth through consensus, through mob rule, by, as we see from history and even recent history, the mob is ruled by emotion and impulse. Given the opportunity, they would easily destroy a masterpiece, murder an innocent, engross themselves in the gore-filled violence of fruitless mayhem. However, like all points within the civilizational cycle, where intellectualism takes hold, deconstructionism becomes apparent because when a population begins to have a consistent abundance of resources to create an intellectual and philosopher class, then more times than not, that said intellectual or philosopher class drifts towards the abstract, the reverie of full moral superiority that's found within that, and the short-lived egomaniacal joy derived from the from dismantling the very system and its limitations that gave birth to the luxury of them pursuing intellectualism in the first place. In short, and ironically, intellectualism tends towards the end of rationality, as being an obsolete and constraining product of the human condition and its juxtaposition to the cycles of time. Managerialism is the final forlorn of the intellectual age that marks the seminal instance of decline within any civilization. Unable and unwilling to dispose of their failed moral theories, built upon the loose sand of their own incorrigible and misplaced moral fortitude, they, the managerialist, impose upon the civilization their personal vision of utopianism and conclude that they are the only ones upon earth that have the best interests of the species at heart, that they are the wise elders and we are mere misguided rabble that are obstructing with our incessant protestation their realization of the full potential of the species Of course, such hubristic maxims are dangerous and lead to a cultish zeal, a fanaticism which shall lead to them becoming murderous when the world rejects their insane global intentions. Like the Surrealists, the Managerialists, 
also seek to defy reality, to defy natural order and the limitation of reason, and they will stop at nothing until they have reconstructed that tower which shall reach into the lofty abode of heaven. There, pry and open the glistening gates adorned with peril and gilded in gold, they shall fight their way to the throne of the undying primacy of God, and in an act of Saturnian treachery they shall usurp and mutilate the crown of the cosmos, the scepter of all power, and the orb of all existence, or so they believe, and by them pursuing this metaphorical goal of ascending beyond the limitations of humanity, by becoming transhuman, do they believe that they shall become the masters of their own destiny at last, secure in the fact that no mortal or immortal God may oppose their rule, now and until the end of time and space, until the end of the dream of reality.